So now that we've talked about the executor service interface, it's time to talk about how that interface can be implemented. And there's a whole variety of ways to do it. And here's one way that's the most common way, and that's to use something called the Java Thread Pool Executor. And we're going to talk about how you can use this in conjunction with the executor service interface. Thread Pool Executor is a class that implements the executor service interface, but it does it indirectly by extending the abstract executor service superclass, which itself in turn implements the executor service interface. The executor service interface, when implemented by Thread Pool Executor, runs each of the submitted tasks using a worker thread that's provided by a pool of threads. And we'll see there's a bunch of different ways of doing all this stuff. Thread Pool Executor is very, very powerful. So you can see that Thread Pool Executor uses this worker thread class to do various things. And so basically what happens when you when you execute or you submit a task, it gets stored in something called a work queue. And that work queue will then be used to feed a pool of worker threads. And the work queue itself is something called a blocking queue. And that means if the queue is full, then calls to submit will block. And if the queue is empty, then threads in the pool of threads will have to block waiting for some work to show up that they can they can process. Thread pool executor is really, really configurable. There are about a half dozen different properties that you can control when you create an instance of thread pool executor. Now it turns out in practice, you usually don't create the thread pool executor instances yourself. <laughs> Excuse me. It turns out in practice, you don't typically create thread pool executor instances directly, but instead you create them through the executor's factory methods like new fixed thread pool and new cached thread pool. And we'll talk more about that later. So here's some of the parameters that can be used to control the various properties of a thread pool executor. The first two parameters are core pool size and maximum pool size. Core pool size indicates the number of threads to keep in the pool even if they're not currently being used to run anything. So even if they're quote idle, then you could still just say, I, I always wanna have at least four threads in the pool, even if they're not doing anything. So that's the core pool size. Then there's also something called maximum pool size, which is the maximum number of threads that are allowed to be in the pool. And again, you can make core pool size and max pool size the same, which is what the fixed thread pool executor does, or you can have the max pool size be essentially infinite up to a the size of an int and then allow the pool to grow and grow and grow. There's some other parameters that can be passed to the thread pool executor constructor that control the life cycle of the threads. And this is the keep alive time and the time unit. So the keep alive time is the maximum time in the time unit, which is something like, as we'll see, milliseconds or microseconds or seconds or whatnot. But the keep alive time is the maximum time in the time unit that excessive idle threads will wait uh, when new tasks are terminated when the number of threads is greater than the core pool size. So, so what does that really mean? It means if maximum pool size is bigger than core pool size and the keep alive time is set to something other than zero, that after that time elapses and threads have not been used for anything, they've been idle that entire span of time, then that indicates to the thread pool executor to terminate those excessive idle threads, bringing it back down to the core pool size. There's also something called a work queue. And the work queue is a blocking queue that's used to hold tasks before that they're actually used by the threads in the pool. And we'll see there's a bunch of different implementations of work queue that come out of the box and they're all so-called blocking queue uh, implementations. One type of blocking queue is called a synchronous queue. And that actually really isn't a queue at all. It's used for direct handoffs. And this is used by the cached thread pool implementation. And so what it'll do, the work, the synchronous queue basically will check to see if there's any current threads that are idle in the pool. And if so, it'll hand off the work to one of those threads. If there are no idle threads in the pool, then synchronous queue will spawn a new thread and then hand off the work to that. 
this is what's sometimes called the, the rendezvous model of computing, where the caller blocks until the task is handed off to a new thread or to a cache thread. The good things about the direct handoff model is you don't have to worry about deadlocking on internal dependencies like a fixed size queue because there'll always be a thread to run it even if a new one has to be allocated. And of course, the downside is that under bursty traffic load, if lots of things show up all at the same time, you can create a very large number of threads because you'll end up having to make a thread for every new piece of work that shows up. And if they run for a long time, you can have a lot of threads. Another model that you can implement with the blocking queue parameter, the work queue parameter to the thread pool executor is the so-called unbounded queue model. And this is used by the fixed sized thread pool by default. So if you just use the new fixed thread pool factory method on the executor's interface, you'll get an unbounded queue. The nice thing about the unbounded queue is it smooths bursty requests. So if lots of requests come in at the same time, they're simply queued awaiting subsequent execution when the uh, processor cores can catch up in the, in the work thread pool, worker thread pool. And that kind of smooths things out a bit more without having to chew up large numbers of threads. It's kind of like the way that uh, stores like Walmart or Target will, or maybe Amazon will hire seasonal workers to handle Christmas load or, or holiday load, for example. The downside with an unbounded queue is kind of like the downside with the, the cache thread pool we were talking about, where it can consume an unlimited amount of resources if work comes in faster than you can keep up. So if work is coming in really fast, you can queue it, queue it, queue it. But eventually, if you can't process it fast enough, the memory in the machine will all be eaten up and you'll, uh, you'll crash for other reasons. You can also have what's called a bounded queue. Now, this doesn't come out of the box, but you could make your own instance of thread pool executor and you could give it a bounded queue, which would be a queue that had a fixed size to it. Such you could use, for example, the array blocking queue and give it a fixed size. The good thing about this is you don't end up with resource uh, overutilization. You can, you can bound the amount of resources that are used. You can put your queue on a diet, if, if you will. The downside is that figuring out the size to make the queue is tough because you don't know really what size it should be. And it could also end up with deadlock. And we've talked about deadlock with these things before. Take a look at the link at the bottom of the page to find out how a bounded queue and a fixed size thread pool can lead to lead to deadlock. The final parameter that is passed to the constructor of thread pool executor is something called a thread factory. And this is the factory that's used when creating a new thread. And so in this particular case, uh, the thread factory is used to allow you to get control over the properties of the threads that the thread pool executor uses to make up part of its worker thread pool. And the nice thing about this is that it gives you an opportunity to kind of have a hook to add in different characteristics for your, for your worker threads. For example, you could have different priorities. You could make the threads be daemon threads. You can give them different names. You could use special thread creation mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. So it gives you lots of flexibility to make the threads in a more flexible way. So that's the overview of some of the properties that can be controlled with the thread pool executor. As you can see, it's very powerful. You can also see that because it's so powerful that they give you a couple of predefined factory methods as part of the executor's utility class to kind of get a handle on all the flexibility and give you nice defaults, such as a fixed size thread pool, which sets those parameters to certain values, and also a, a cache thread pool, which sets the parameters to the thread pool executor to be a little bit different. When we talk about the executor's class implementation later in the course, you'll actually get to see how the parameters are passed to the different versions of thread pool executor to get a fixed thread pool and a cache thread pool. But that'll come a little bit later.